<clears throat> oh, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eric and his colleagues for including me among this group. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be introduced by Bob. We've had a number of interactions uh, uh, over the years, uh, mainly focused on, on finishing genomes. And uh, in fact, Bob, uh, I think it was you that actually compiled the list of the most difficult genomes to finish. Uh, and so we're, we're very excited to now have, uh, we have uh, in, in, uh, in review, I guess, a manuscript that's describing the platypus genome, which really was, as you told us, the most difficult to sequence. <clears throat> so uh, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the next generation sequencing technologies. And you heard a bit of this from Richard, so I'll try to be complimentary rather than redundant. Um, <clears throat> I do want to say, <clears throat> excuse me, a little uh, frog in the throat here this morning. Uh, I do want to say first congratulations to NISC. Uh, you know, genome centers are all about accomplishments and milestones and firsts. So I have to give, it to, give you guys credit. I think you're pretty sure you're the first genome center to have a, a 10th anniversary party at least. So nice going. But if you think about this, if, if, for those of you that really know Eric, this is not all that surprising because Eric loves to celebrate. <laughs> so I've known Eric for a long time, uh, since 1990 when I moved from Caltech uh, to Washington University. And he ended up just down the, uh, the hallway from me. And back then we had next generation sequencing, at least the first iteration of next generation sequencing, where we actually started getting rid of radioactivity and the autorads that we used to, uh, you know, manually read into the gel. Uh, and so we had a, a lab uh, where we had a couple of these boxes that are shown over there on the left. This is the old ABI uh, 373. And Eric actually got one for his lab just down the hall before he uh, uh, moved up to Bethesda. So this was exciting back in those days. 36 lanes. Woohoo. <clears throat> of course, we now have additional uh, next generation sequencing. This is the next round and, and shown on this slide are are the three current platforms that we're all trying very hard to understand uh, how they work and what the impact might be and what sorts of experiments that we can do that even just a few years ago uh, we really could have only uh, dreamed about doing. So this is the Selexa instrument now uh, manufactured by Illumina on the lower left, the 454 instrument up in the center, and, and the new ABI solid instrument uh, down on the lower right. <clears throat> So I want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do with some of these platforms. I, I want to go back a little bit because, you know, the promise of the human genome sequence was always that it was going to revolutionize biological research, going to revolutionize medical research and, and the way that we look at ourselves. And in, even just having conversations about now how many people in the auditorium would like to actually have their genome sequenced. It's pretty amazing to think back on this. But the reference sequence, version 1.0 of the genome, now allows us to ask amazing questions. What's come along with version 1.0 of the genome sequence is an amazing amount of technology, software tools, and infrastructure, such as we have at, at all of the genome centers that are represented here today, um, to allow you to actually use this uh, reference sequence to ask interesting questions. It's buttressed by ancillary genome sequences, the mouse, the chimp, and others. And all of this really allows us to, as I said, do experiments that we previously only dreamed about doing. And now what we want to do is to start applying to the, all of this uh, uh, infrastructure and, and, and resource to cancer and, and other diseases. And really now with these next generation sequencing tools coming along, uh, it allows us to, to do this in, in new and exciting ways. So if you think back on uh, how we approached cancer initially with sequencing, you heard Richard talk just a little bit about this. Uh, we used PCR, and we, we all, we, we'd been using PCR-based sequence for many years, but one of the things that we tried to do maybe five, six years ago was to try to understand how to do it uh, in very large scale, high-throughput PCR-based sequencing. You know, so we came up with all kinds of computer tools to pick primers and to keep track of things. But the most difficult thing was then going through and, and looking at all of the data and trying to find where we actually believed that we were seeing synonymous changes or non-synonymous changes and so forth. But this was the paradigm a few years ago. We want to approach a cancer. We have a list of candidate genes that we think might be involved in, in a particular cancer that we were interested in. Uh, and then we get a large collection of patient samples. Large, a few years ago, was about 50, maybe 100. 
And it actually worked in some cases. This is one of the poster children uh, for this type of approach. Uh, a number of uh, studies uh, were done. We actually did one uh, from our genome center in collaboration with Harold Varmus and colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where we looked at a number of kinase genes uh, in non-small cell lung cancer patients. And in the epidermal growth factor receptor, receptor gene, voila, we found quite a few mutations all focused in the tyrosine kinase domain of this protein. And this just, uh, this coupled with some very nice uh, phenotype information. One of the things that we found were quite a few patients uh, with non-small cell lung cancer, typically non-smokers, who were treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitor drugs, such as Aresa and Tarceva, had mutations in their EGFR uh, genes more often than not. So this was very exciting and sort of uh, seemed to be uh, uh, a promise of things to come from additional sequencing. The work that we did there in lung cancer, coupled with the work that was going on at both the, the, uh, the Baylor and Broad uh, genome centers, uh, led all three of us to sort of uh, put our heads together on uh, a little project that we call the Tumor Se Sequencing Project, or TSP. And in this project, we expanded our uh, candidate gene list to about 1,000 genes. It actually turned out to be closer to 600 by the time we were finished. Uh, with about 200 very high-quality lung adenocarcinoma samples. And just briefly, the TSP uh, was organized late 2005. The focus, as I said, was on lung adeno. Uh, we had a target list of about uh, 600 genes, three sequencing centers working together. We enlisted uh, several cancer centers to mainly help us uh, collect and characterize uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma tissue samples. Out of an initial set of about 800, we focused down on about 200 that we uh, thought were uh, quality enough for sequencing. Divided up the labor, each of the, uh, the three centers did about uh, 3,000 amplicons, roughly 300 genes, and we had a common set of roughly 100 genes that we could use as sort of a cross-center comparison. Uh, we're currently now, we have all the sequencing done, and we're currently in the, the process of, of going through this data analysis. Some interesting things have come out of this already. Uh, this just shows you um, uh, some mutations that we've seen. If you, if you then stratify uh, all of these samples and you look at smokers versus never smokers, you can find some differences. Uh, for example, uh, you're more apt to find uh, mutations in EGFR, GRB2, and GRB7 in never smokers, whereas KRAS and MET mutations are more common in smokers. Likewise, you can use the mutations that you find in some genes, notably TP53, ERB3, and AKT3, to sort of get some idea of tumor grade. So as you can see over here in grade one tumors, we didn't find any mutations in these three genes. In grade two, we start to see TP53 mutations popping up. And then in grade three, we start to see more TP3, TP53, the ERB3 are coming up, as well as some mutations in AKT3. This is early data but uh, interesting trends nonetheless. The other thing that we found that was really exciting, and there's now a paper in press uh, 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 describing this work. Early on, we used uh, AFI SNP arrays to sort of qualify the DNAs that we wanted to sequence, get some idea of what we actually had in hand, make sure that these were sufficient quantity and quality for sequencing. And we actually found several interesting amplifications that represented potentially uh, uh, new targets that we could add to our sequencing list. Uh, so we, we did see through these amplifications some that had oncogenes uh, in the intervals, and this wasn't necessarily surprising. But there were quite a few. TITF1, for example, uh, was exciting. And this is a, a uh, lineage gene uh, for the development of lung tissue. So the idea here was to start to plug together the two technologies, sort of a whole uh, genome array-based approach with the sequencing uh, focused on PCR. So this has sort of led to our second paradigm. Rather than simply focusing on sort of hypothesis-driven gene lists, which are somewhat biased in terms of the expectations that you have of what's going on in the genome in a particular type of cancer, we now are moving more to including uh, uh, data-driven uh, targets that come from uh, using such orthologous technologies as array-based RNA profiling, CGH, and SNP genotyping. And this has been quite exciting. The, the, the next sort of large-scale collaborative phase of cancer uh, genomics is, is underway now, uh, known as the TCGA. And this is um, uh, 
a project that involves the same three sequencing centers, but now quite a few CGCCs, or cancer genome characterization centers, and the idea is the same. The sequencing centers have gotten started off on hypothesis-driven gene target lists, uh, and then using data that comes from uh, the various types of analyses that these centers are doing, we add additional targets that can be, uh, that the sequencing power can be focused on. Well, I want to go back and tell a little story uh, because I want to take you into some of this next generation sequencing technology. We started another uh, cancer project in 2002 as a collaboration between uh, the Genome Sequencing Center and our colleague uh, at Washington University, Tim Lay, who was interested in acute myelogenous leukemia, which is a very nasty uh, adult leukemia. And when, when we started, it was the same sort of paradigm. It was uh, an attempt to use high-throughput PCR-based sequencing and focus on a uh, hypothesis-driven list. A couple of features of this project, we used uh, primary tumors rather than cell lines as our substrate for sequencing. Uh, in all cases, we would use match normal tissue along with the tumor tissue uh, so that we could get a quick idea as to what we were seeing in terms of germline versus somatic uh, variations. We had a discovery set, a small set of samples of, of 96 matched tumor normals. Uh, and then any time we would find what looked to be a, a mutation in that discovery set, we'd then go and resequence it in an additional uh, validation set of 94 uh, tumors. We had a, a gene list of about 450 genes. Uh, and then we also used uh, sort of this orthogonal approach with CGH arrays, expression profile, and uh, et cetera, to contribute additional targets to the list. Uh, and this worked quite well, and guess what? We found mutations in genes, and none of the genes that we found mutation in were all that surprising, considering that we were looking at leukemia. So we, we asked ourselves a lot of questions, and one of the things that certainly kept us up uh, at night was, what are we missing? Uh, we're focused only on exons. We're mainly focused on exons for genes that we expect might have mutations. What about all the other genes? Uh, so in terms of starting to move away from, from hypothesis-driven uh, gene sequencing, there are a lot of ways that can go. The, the Hopkins study uh, that came out, uh, Velkulescu was the senior author. Uh, this group looked at 13,000 genes uh, using, again, a PCR-based approach in uh, 11 uh, colon and 11 breast cancer cell lines and found interesting mutations. Uh, but this is just a start. This is a relatively small number of samples. You know, how do, we, how do we scale this up? The problem with PCR-based resequencing, it's relatively expensive. It's diploid at best. Uh, some tumors, uh, you're going to have many, many more copies of uh, particular alleles. And it's low coverage. So how can we improve? And also, again, what are we missing outside of the exons? Well, we decided to try to take the next step with our AML project. Uh, and we have... Uh, started on uh, sequencing a whole genome using the Selexa technology. This is our case, uh, referred to as 933124. This uh, was a 57-year-old Caucasian female who presented with a de novo M1 AML. Uh, at her initial diagnosis, she presented with 100% uh, myeloblasts in her bone marrow sample, and this is what we've used for our studies. The uh, patient relapsed and died 11 months later. In Doing quite a few different types of analyses on her genome, uh, we're, we found that she has completely normal cytogenetics, uh, as best as one can tell. Using NimbleGen arrays, the 2.1 uh, million array, she, we found one tiny amplification on chromosome 7, about 7 KB. There was no loss of heterozygosity detected on the AFI 500 KSNP array. Uh, we did find through our PCAR-based sequencing that uh, two mutations, uh, an expanded internal tandem duplication in the FLT3 gene, uh, and then uh, a point mutation in her NPM1 uh, gene. So we had, whole, uh, we had informed consent for whole genome sequencing uh, and eventually data release, uh, and off we went. So this just shows you the uh, histology sample. This was 100% blasts. Uh, on the slide. So we had a really clean tumor here for sequencing. There uh, really weren't any worries. This is a liquid tumor, uh, so there weren't concerns about stromal contamination. As I said, she presented at 100% blast, uh, and um, uh, she also has, as it appears, a, a completely diploid uh, genome. 
Well, one of the things that we always ask ourselves when we start sequencing a genome is what kind of coverage do we need? We had some idea of this uh, for the old sort of uh, ABI-based uh, sequencing. You could say at, when we got to 8x or 10x coverage, we had a pretty good idea of what the utility of that sequence might be. Well, using this new uh, sequencing platform, uh, where we're getting much shorter reads, we had some questions as to what coverage would we really need, and we spent a lot of time busying our statisticians and trying to come up with coverage models, theoretical coverage models, that maybe they were right and maybe they weren't. One of the measures that we thought we could come up with, perhaps, is we've collected all of these uh, polymorphisms uh, using various types of arrays. Could we simply use those as a way to measure coverage? So if, as we generate sequence, can we go and look for all of these SNPs that we found with arrays and as we find 90, 95, closer to 100%, can that then give us some sort of metric of how close to finished we are with the sequencing? So here's just a quick update in terms of the numbers. As of last week, uh, we had done 55 runs of the uh, Selexa slash Illumina instrument, uh, collecting 32 base read, uh, reads in each of these runs, about 44 uh, billion base pairs, which calculates out to about 14 and a half X haploid coverage. We've detected uh, 210,000 SNPs in this genome. 83% of these are present in DB SNP. And then here's our coverage metric. Out of the 481,000 uh, SNPs that we saw on arrays, we've now identified about 183,000 or roughly 38%. So just in terms of going through this, how close are we to being finished exercise, Right, For, using this metric, 14x haploid coverage represents about 40% diploid coverage. Our, our theoretical calculation said that we were going to need 25 to 30x coverage with these short reads to get an uh, to reach a goal of about 99% of the sequence coverage and variance detected. So this looks like we're we're on the right uh, slope here, and it also seems to converge nicely with some of the other uh, centers that are starting to use this technology are seeing with regard to coverage. We also use the new technology to do some cDNA sequencing. So cDNA sequencing is not a technique that's dead and needs to be put away. This has actually been quite useful. We've used a number of uh, different cDNA uh, library construction procedures and normalization schemes that all fit very well with the whole idea of putting little bits of DNA on solid support as one needs to do for these new platforms. And these were sequenced on both 454 uh, and Selexa. So I, I have our pipeline up here, and I, I, I think just the key points are is that as these reads from both genomic and cDNA libraries come through uh, and, and are checked here, uh, looking for SNPs and small indels and so forth, uh, one of the key things that we do is at some point, uh, especially for non-synonymous and splice uh, site uh, putative variants, we then go back to the old PCR-based uh, sequencing pipeline to try and validate as well as look at the same sequence variants in other AML patient samples. So what have we done so far? We've really focused uh, as a top priority on sequence variants that appear to be non-synonymous, that are not in dbSNP, that are detected multiple times in the cDNA uh, sequencing effort, uh, and that are detected at least once in the tumor uh, DNA. So this, this again is, this is ongoing. We don't have all the coverage that we'd like yet from this particular patient's genome but we found 59 non-synonymous variants in 43 genes. Most of these are likely rare SNPs. The two somatic mutations that we had found using the PCR-based approach with this same genome uh, were found again with the uh, Selexa sequencing method uh, and FLT, the, the uh, internal tandem du duplication in FLT3 and the N NPM1 uh, mutation. One additional somatic mutation was discovered in FLT3 uh, a uh, non-synonymous change here at uh, amino acid position 194. All of the other variants, and these are all coding, all of the other variants were localized to genes that had not been previously implicated in AML pathogenesis and hence were not on our original target list. Uh, and we have identified at least three other uh, putative somatic mutations and these are currently going through our PCR uh, based sequencing pipeline for confirmation. This may be pretty hard to see from the back, but what I'm showing you here is just what we can get out of the cDNA sequencing approach. So uh, I'm showing you the, the one somatic mutation that we found in, in FLT3, 
And what you have here is an alignment of uh, Selexa reads from the tumor genome as well as from the cDNA sequencing effort. So we get a nice match uh, of, of the, the Ts, the reads with the Ts and reads with the Cs, doing no more of comparison or figuring out how high a little peak is underneath another peak. You actually get a nice almost digital readout uh, of the frequency of these two alleles. So, um, and we see the same thing over here. Uh, this would suggest about a 50-50 uh, 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 match, 50-50 uh, expression levels between the two uh, alleles. And we can then extrapolate that to quite a few other genes. So what you're looking at here is for uh, several genes uh, listed here. These are the frequencies uh, of the uh, expressed copies of the variant and the germline sequences. So, for example, um, uh, in this one here, uh, PTPN11, uh, we see about 200 uh, to 1, or perhaps 0, uh, the variant uh, allele with regard to the, or as compared to the germline. Up here, you get a little bit more of a mix, about 4 to, four to 1. Uh, in some cases, it's a little bit more of the 50-50. We've also uh, discovered several novel splice variants using this. Uh, genes are listed over here. Uh, for example, R RPAIN1, uh, five new uh, uh, splice variants uh, have been detected and, and characterized uh, using this combination cDNA and, and genome sequencing approach. Um, and quite a few others as well. So just to summarize uh, a few points, so next generation sequencing is here, at least this iteration of it, and uh, we can clearly see already that it will have a substantial impact on the study of the cancer genome as well as uh, for other uh, human diseases. The coverage models for next generation whole genome sequencing uh, are converging. We're starting to better understand exactly what we can do and how much work it takes. Uh, these ancillary or orthologous genome-based uh, technologies are really crucial for understanding uh, the target genome uh, before you uh, actually start all this large genome sequencing. So the SNP arrays, uh, I think, still have some value. And then this transcriptome-based approach using cDNAs, either as a standalone approach or in concert with a whole genome uh, sequencing effort, represents a pretty powerful uh, adjunct for cancer genome analysis. More is clearly needed. We're very early days of, of all of these technologies, and one of the things that I think you'll, you'll get the message of here uh, today is that uh, all of us are trying to figure out how to bring these to bear, what they can be used for, what sorts of upfront strategies and tools and technologies we need to develop uh, to make them even more powerful. So if my last slide will come up, which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, uh, I can uh, see a list of some of my colleagues. The acknowledgments doesn't want to happen. So uh, if anybody can explain that bit of Mac Macintoshology to me, that would be appreciated. So thanks. Questions for Rick? Jeff? So I'm trying to decide if your argument to some extent might be for or against the Valescu model, meaning that ultimately, a year from now, three months from now, the whole genome association and the whole genome sequencing will both be of sufficient depth and sufficient quality. But if today you wanted to define mutations at a, at a level of quality that at least based on standard Sanger-based sequencing, you have and others in this room have defined the value proposition would still seem to be weighted in that direction. And yet, I, so I, I almost, again, I'm trying to uh, understand the dichotomy between that, the short-term value of implementing ABI-based sequencing in support of cancer sequencing today across defined exons versus uh, waiting for whole genome sequencing. So I think, I think it's, like I said, Jeff, I think it's still really early days on a lot of the sort of approaches that I uh, described that, that we're trying to use on AML. I think there still is value in the PCR-based approach. I mean, clearly you find things that are of use in studying cancer. So I wouldn't shut down that pipeline quite yet. I think we can improve on it still, and then we can at some point transition nicely, I think, to some of these next-generation technologies. Um, 
there's, there's still a point, there's still a place for a hypothesis driven sequencing and I think uh, Richard's example of the, uh, the capture array and the 454 sequencing is a nice sort of uh, next place to go if you will uh, for that sort of targeted sequencing. And uh, it's cheaper and allows us to do a lot more work. Karen. Hey Greg, nice talk. Um, I was wondering how long you think that you and the rest of the community will be tinkering with this iteration of next-gen sequencing before the next iteration of next-gen sequencing comes along? Uh, so that's a great question, Karen. Uh, I, th I think we have uh, plenty to keep us busy at least for, what do you guys figure, another 10 years? Uh, but uh, we already see things that are right on the horizon, I think, in the next year or two that will give all of these current platforms a bit of a run for their money. So that's exciting. And it's, and it's nice to have sort of a competitive situation now. We all went through the time where there was only one player and technology moved along as that player allowed. So. One more over here. Hi, Rick. That, this is actually something that occurred to me during uh -oh. the Uh-oh. You're yeah. supposed to be on, not just shout. Uh, this is something that actually occurred to me during Claire's talk. I'm not sure if you're the best person to answer it, but um, it seems to me that with the variety of microbial genomes that exist in humans um, and the collection of variants that each individual would have, and then again, the host genome of human, <coughs> excuse me, and the difficulty we've had making associations between variants in the human genome with disease, is there anybody who's looking at associations between the microbial, the particular microbial variants that people have, say, in their colon or in their lungs with the variants in the human genome and the possible impact that has on uh, cancer? Yes. <laughs> that, and Claire talked a little bit about the, this microbiome initiative, which is just underway. And I, I think it's, it's initially a cataloging uh, exercise. But the association, uh, especially between uh, health and disease, is, is right around the corner, I think. I don't know if Claire wants to add to that. I agree. She agreed. We have concurrence. Okay, thank you, Rick.